Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Here we are on a given Monday. And uh, you, if you hadn't noticed, uh, Think Tech likes energy. We cover energy five times a week, every single week. We have covered it for 10, 15, almost 20 years. And so um, whenever we stumble on somebody who can tell us about global energy, uh, we go for that. And we, and we found Hassan Ahmad, uh, who is in Los Angeles now, who is a global energy guy, and he's willing to tell us about global energy. And we are so excited. Uh, thank you, Hassan, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Jay. So tell us a little about why you're an expert in global energy. Uh, I ended up spending most of my career um, in the energy industry. I just sort of, I, I came into finance um, right just, I should say, before the shale revolution happened in 2006. And uh, energy sector, you know, it had a lot of geopolitics to it, which made it volatile. But with the shale, it ended up being a very capital intensive sector. And my background before that was in uh, leverage finance. So, you know, factor in the, the capital needs of the sector, factor in my leverage finance background. And we went on a, you know, 12, 13 year ride of just tons of debt issuance, tons of restructurings, um, a lot of volatility in the sector and a, a whole new shale industry in that time period. Yeah, and you're a graduate of the uh, NYU Graduate Business uh, School uh, down in Wall Street. Uh, used to call it GBA when I went to the law school there. Now they call it the Stern School, um, probably because Mr. Stern was very generous in some underwriting he did for the school. But it's a wonderful school. It's probably the best business school in the world, in the world. And, and we have you here on the show. We're so excited to talk to somebody from the Stern School on oil and, and energy in general. So let's talk about, uh, you, know, um, you know, what has happened in the, this is prior to now, prior, up till now, what has happened in renewables and what has happened in oil? I mean, I know the U.S. is exporting more oil now than it was. The U.S. is exporting natural gas to beat the band. Um, so where does that fit with renewables? How has our renewable initiative been doing? I'll start with, with sort of the technological demand side of, of the energy equation. Um, renewables are an industry that is on, a, on, a, on its life cycle still in a relatively you know, stage of infancy. Uh, you need government subsidies to make it functional for the most part. Um, there are places like California, which have so much sun, you know, the Mojave Desert, these different places, um, where the cost of energy has come down dramatically, um, so much so that it's cheaper than almost any other source then maybe hydro, depending on the amount of money in the snow you get. Um, at the same time, the limitations of you know, these, these technologies is storage. Um, we don't have, and we're in the process of developing you know, better storage alternatives for solar. Um, so for example, if you generate you know, power on the grid from solar sources, you either have to use it in the state or you have to export it. Um, if you don't have a lot of storage capacity or storage technologies that allow you to use it at different times, it just goes away. That's why we need other, you know, alternative sources like oil and gas. Um, and to a certain you know, coal, we've moved away from quite a bit in this country. Uh, we continue to do so. But yes, natural gas and oil um, are going to be around for quite some time, despite sort of the headlines of, you know, solar being a greater share of kind of modern. Yeah, the Trump administration has been encouraging to oil and gas in many ways, um, and maybe not so encouraging to renewables. But let me ask you that if you had a president and an administration that was more interested in renewables, and you had a Congress that would back them up, you know, financially with tax credits and the like, uh, would we do, this is, this is a question that answers itself, would we be doing better, more, you know, more, more, in, more, more ubiquitous on, on renewables? Sure, I mean, if you have federal level support, no doubt about it, you will do better. Um, if you look at the states, state by state, you know, California has kind of led a, a lot of this renewable initiative. Um, we, I'll give you an example of California. 10, 15 years ago, we had a very large, you know, independent power um, sector, power capacity in the state. If you remember back in the early 2000s, the rolling blackouts, you know, these, these types of issues. Um, these power plants, for the most part, they're no longer needed um, because we have the solar capacity in this state. Um, so a lot of these, these power plants that were very profitable, profitable in the early 2000s, you know, late 2008, 2009 type timeframe, 
they're not even needed anymore. We still have them around because of, you know, we do need spare capacity in the event there is some sort of issue in the state. And the state, you know, like most states, pays these power plants to stay, you know, available. Um, we call it fixed capacity payments. But ultimately, we don't need these. So it starts at the state level. And if you do have federal backing, it does make it that much easier. Um, the federal government, unfortunately, you have to focus them on different things. So one of the things that the federal government is really good at doing is saying, here's a lot of money, um, but targeting it so that it's highly effective, a very different story. So they might put money to the auto sector, for example, um, to produce you know, electric vehicles because they like the amount of jobs that come out of that. But they may not necessarily give money to battery storage and these types of issues because they may not produce a lot of jobs. That's really what we need though, right? The ability to store these things and make them more commercial and distributable. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really critical point. I'm gonna put that in my notes. Everybody write this down, okay? Um, the, the world of the utility is changing. Um, it changed in California. It's probably gonna change everywhere, including Hawaii. The old notion of having, you know, the hub and the spokes and, and, and all the, you know, the people out there taking power directly from the utility. I think that's changing. It's over, we passed a, a tipping point. Am I right about that? It's gonna be different going forward, isn't it? It's going to be different going forward. We, you know, every state has to deal with its own sets of issues. Um, you know, for example, if you go to Ohio, um, they have, you know, a large regulated utility uh, capacity base. And some of these regulated utility plants are nuclear power plants. Okay. Nuclear power plant employs about 3,000 people. Um, a natural gas facility employs about 400 people. Uh, you know, a solar panel facility employs very little people. Um, so you're brushing up against these issues. And, and so the question becomes uh, on every state level, it's not just what's good for the environment. It's also what's good for you know, local employment. Yeah. Is that the best way? Is, is that the best way, Hassan? Or should we have uh, national leadership on that and, and, uh, and do, do you know, initiatives that are national? I think you have to establish the metrics for how we all think about things as a society, right? Um, you know, in, in this country, there's a debate about even global warming, you know, for this, to this issue, right? So that's our starting point. Um, you know, if we all can get behind the fact that global warming scientifically seems very, 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 you know, possible and, and highly likely caused by man, um, then we can all agree upon some metrics, right? When do we re reduce these emissions by? How do we reduce them? Who gets hurt? Who doesn't get hurt? Um, you know, there are a lot of people in West Virginia who have been coal mining, you know, facilities for generations. It's a family thing. Um, and they, you know, are seeing their livelihoods taken away. It, it's not being done nefariously. It's just being done through capitalism and, and technological change. And we need to find jobs for these people. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it's really hard to sell people on changing their lifestyle. And, and you know, politically, that's a very hard message to get across. To people. Yeah, sure. And we, we all have that, especially in the time of, of COVID. Uh, you mentioned nuclear energy, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm attracted to a discussion of that. Uh, in Hawaii, we have a constitutional provision that prohibits it, except on a vote of, I think, it's three quarters of the legislature. Not likely to happen politically. Um, however, nuclear does have a lot to offer these days, and one wonders why uh, we don't go into it, uh, you know, in, in larger steps. What do you think? Uh, it, it's a two-pronged problem. One is, you know, nuclear is. is from an emission standpoint, it's excellent. Right? There's very little emissions. Um, from a, a risk standpoint, um, nobody wants to have a nuclear power plant built in your backyard. So I, I, I don't know the exact number, but I believe it's 25 or 30 years we have not had a new nuclear facility built in this country. Um, you know, in fact, they're being decommissioned. I mean, you're not just seeing it in the States, you're seeing it in places like Germany, um, places like Japan, Africa, Fukushima. Um, you know, the, the there is a gap, though, in what the risks are and, and what has been done subsequent to these risks being discovered. Right? So technology, from my understanding, has come a long, long way from what we had in the 80s. Um, unfortunately, it's just it's politically very difficult to sell that to people. Um, and beyond that, they're, they're very expensive. Um, there's maybe two or three companies that I'm aware of, you know, it, commercially that could produce them in this country. Um, and these, you know, these cost in the neighborhood of you know, billions and billions of dollars. Um, they are very capital intensive, time intensive, um, and they typically the lower budget and over time. Yeah, it's interesting. If we haven't built one since Three Mile Island or whenever that was back, back in the 70s, I guess, um, you'd have to marshal an awful lot of 
talent and resources and and retrain everyone in the project and, and how to do it, you know, because you, you really have to be safe and that requires expertise. But let me go back to your chart. You made a chart for our discussion today. Can we call up that chart? And can you explain the chart about, I guess it's about oil, yeah. Yeah, so I believe you were asking about, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit today about just what, what oil looks like in a post COVID world. Um, and like everything, I think we're all trying to figure out what 2021 and 2022 look like. Um, so I, what I did here was I sort of gave you what 2019 looked like as a sort of a starting point. So if you look at 2019, you know, we, we have global demand, um, which was roughly about 100 million barrels. It's 99, We were producing just about from 2019. So essentially, in the industry, we call that we were in balance. There was no major inventory builds. You know, what the market needed is what the market got, and that was the end of it. Um, and then when you get to 2020, you know, we faced COVID starting in March and the, the, the fall off was dramatic. So we saw, you know, in the, in the depths of March, Chinese demand fell about 10 million barrels a day itself. Um, you know, looks like over the course of 2020, the entire world will see demand fall about 10 million barrels a day. To give you an idea, in a normal year, you will see demand growth of about 1 million barrels a day. So we wiped out about 10 years worth of demand growth in, in, in and so the next question becomes, okay, what does 2021 look like? And that's, that's like everybody's question. No one really knows for sure. Um, you know, we are, contrary to what the stock market is showing you on the screens, we're facing a lot of issues. There are 4 million people who, you know, are in their homes and the, the mortgages are delinquent. 8 million people didn't pay their rent last month. We have 6 million jobless claims. Are continuing claims are um, so these are these are issues that we're going to have to deal with in 2021, and it's not just in the states; it's global. Um, there are a lot of countries, you know, suffering um, still from COVID, and their balance sheets and you know, consumer, corporate, sovereign—they're all in a really bad shape. So the question is: is what's demand look like? So what I did here was, you know, we kind of we looked at, you know, sort of if we went back maybe half half of the demand, uh, if we could talk about five million barrels a day, just for an example, see, you know, what would that do to oil? Well, obviously, demand helps push oil prices up. The real question then becomes is what is the supply? It's a two-pronged issue. Really. Um, OPEC today sits on about 12 million barrels of spare capacity. And we're sitting on a lot of inventory as well. At the bottom of that chart, you'll see days inventory cover, which is essentially you know, how much global inventory is sitting in these you know, OECD countries. Um, it's spiked up about 10 days from 2019 to 2020. Um, and if you look at, you know, OPEC having about 12 million barrels of spare capacity, we have quite a bit of oil still in stock to deal with um, and a lot, you know, more behind it um, from OPEC in case we do have demand growth. So if I was going to see a, a big spike in oil, I would see 2021, sorry, post 2021 is probably where you see it. Um, because, you know, we will have better economic growth, hopefully by that point in time. Um, and the inventory situation will clear itself. Yeah. Um... I just wonder, um, this is um, sort of anecdotal, but uh, so we just had an assassination in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, that could lead to a further destabilization of the Middle East. Uh, I think that was um, clearly predictable for those who planned the assassination, uh, mm -hmm. both uh, Israel and, and um, the US, although there's general denial about that. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, if, if we had a destabilization, in the Middle East, if if we had a war or, you know, some kind of, you know, a destabilization in the Middle East, how would that affect supply? Because it used to be everything that happened in the Middle East affected supply. It's not necessarily the case anymore. So, uh, what's the difference? And what would what would a, a, a you know violence in the Middle East? What kind of effect would it have? Uh. The response I'd give is it really depends on the level of violence, right? Uh, if, if we're shutting down, you know, the Persian Gulf and, and barrels can't leave um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Iran, we have a problem. Um, and so the, the real question becomes is how big is the violence going to be? Um, you know, all without knowing for sure, um, all signs continue to point to sort of tit for tat type violence. Nobody wants to take it too far because they know the consequences are quite perilous. Um, the nature of where we also sit in the world is, you know, I'll give you a good example. So last, I believe it was, it was last year or early part of this year, and there's so much that's happened in 2020, but you, know, you had the attacks on the Saudi 
and knocked out about 10 million barrels a day. Um, you know, we had a spike for about two weeks in oil and it came right back down again. Uh, the, the nice part about global oil dynamics right now is you have multiple sources, um, you know, a lot of inventory stored up in different places. Um, and our ability, especially in the United States, to respond with shale technology is quite quick. Shale produces the bulk majority of its reserves from a well within the first year, year and a half. So once you put that well online, it begins to produce quite dramatically. Well, that's pretty good. Good to hear. You know, diversity is always good. What about uh, Indonesia? Are they coming up in the world of oil? What about uh, Pemex in Mexico? Are they coming up? They have the potential to. Um, Indonesia's oil fields have stayed relatively, you know, tame on the growth side for a few years now. Um, they are not really looking to develop a lot more. I think they've, they've tried to attract foreign capital, but you know, Indonesia is a difficult place to do business sometimes. So you have issues with, you know, not just in the oil industry, if you look at you know, McMoran, their, their, their copper mines, these things, there's always, you know, strikes, government interference, so on and so forth. It's a difficult place to get business done. Um, Mexico, also for the same reasons, there's a lot of difficulty getting business done and attracting capital. So Pemex has a lot of potential um, but much of the money has been squandered for, you know, decades through corruption, you know, government interference, um, red tape. So the good thing for Mexico is they've been able to really rely on U.S. import stream. Um, so, you know, not just you mentioned oil being exported you know, from this country at the beginning of this conversation, but also refined gasoline. Um, Mexico has a shortage of refined, refined capacity. Um, yeah. Refined gasoline is making its way south. Um, we run into inventory for supply here. Does Venezuela matter? The, Venezuela was a supplier. Now I think they're kind of um, neutralized because of their political problems. But uh, are they, are they, do they matter at all to us? They do. Um, they have the largest, largest or second largest oil reserves in the world. Um, so they do matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, number one. Number two. Their crude is a, a very unique type of crude. It's a, you know, what, what I would call a dirty crude. Um, it, it's not pure kind of WTI crude that you see traded on the screens in, in, in you know, on New York exchanges. This is a crude that is actually, it requires a lot more work to be processed, um, but it trades at a much bigger discount to what you'll see on, in, on the New York exchange screens. So this crude actually is very advantageous to use if your refinery has the capacity to produce it. Um, into refined gasoline. Hmm. Do you actually import Venezuelan barrels every day into this country? Um, and it is very advantageous. It allows to kind of diversify the supply. Um, and their crude is actually fairly easy to, to source. You just have to deal with the geopolitical tensions between the two countries. Um, and it has been a, a long going battle. So to examine, you know, what happens in the, in the, in the pivot, I call it the pivot around around COVID, you know, our lives have changed. Our economy certainly has changed. Our use of um, energy has changed. I mean, it, one, one thing was obvious early on is that we're not feeding as much greenhouse gas uh, into the uh, atmosphere now mm -hmm. because there's mm -hmm. less economic activity, but there will be more economic activity. And I, I wonder what you're thinking is <clears throat> about how our, how our energy use <clears throat> will change, has changed and is changing and will change because of the pandemic <clears throat> and the end of the pandemic. Uh, is it good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? What are the transformations in process? So I, I think the good place to start is what is going to be the behavior of everybody going forward. Um, if you kind of look at, you know, we all know we have vaccines now. I guess the bigger question becomes, you know, what, is the, what is society's belief in if you look at kind of the most recent polls, we're kind of looking in the range of 50 to 60 some percent of people are willing to take them, which leaves a large chunk of society still not willing to take them. So if you kind of look at that as issue number one, you know, we're going to be at a, at a relatively depressed phase of, you know, activity that requires energy usage for, let's say, at least a year, year and a half until everyone either feels comfortable taking the vaccine or not. Um, so that's the starting point. The second thing is, you know, as you and I talk on Zoom here, um, there is a large chunk of commercial real estate in this country um, that will no longer be needed from an office standpoint, right? People have learned that they don't need to go to the office to still do their work. 
there are technologies available. Now, there's probably going to be, my guess is, you know, some corporations that go fully work from home. There's going to be some that say we're never going to do that. And there's going to be everything in between. Um, what we know, though, is that ultimately going from where we were in 2019 to 2020 means less commuting, um, less, you know, visits to the office, less visits to your customers, um, more transactions done over the Internet. So, again, you will probably face an issue with what is our, you know, miles driven every year? How much do we really need that second car in the family? these types of questions. All of those things, you know, are, are probably boating to, or suggesting a world of less energy intensity per person, per capita. That's the way I would think about it. Yeah, I'd take this uh, in a small, medium-sized business right now, mm -hmm. facing the end of the year, potentially uh, a renewal of its lease. And the management sits together and says, you know, do we really need this space? Maybe not. We've learned a lot using Zoom. Uh, maybe we can do more, or maybe you can do everything by Zoom, so our people won't have to go to that the risk, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we don't have to drive. We don't have to rent space downtown. There's, there's so many benefits to it that it, it's inevitable. And and the other part is, you know, suppose I'm wrong about this. Suppose I really do need space. Well, I can reverse that. I can go back into you know, office space later because there will be plenty of it around. Landlords will suffer, but tenants, this is going to be a tenant market, I'm sure, as we go forward. And it's not, and it's not going to improve anytime immediately anyway. So the other thing is you're, you're a hedge fund guy. You, you've been hither and yon, including, what is it, Beach Boy, Beach Boy? What do you call that? Yeah, Beach Point. Um, I work for a firm called Serengeti, so some interesting places. <laughs> And you're, you're consulting and investing and consulting with investors and the like. <clears throat> so I can't resist asking you, you know, where, 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 where the gold is, so to speak. Um, should we be looking at oil and gas? Should we be looking at renewables? Are you optimistic about that? Uh, should we be looking at, for example, we have geothermal or ORMAT. Uh, you must know about ORMAT uh, out here in Hawaii. Um, <clears throat> what, what's, what's, or a, a, a basket, a basket of energy stocks. Yeah. Uh, because it seems to me that, uh, you know, it moves together and it may be moving in a good direction overall. So what do I do if I am, am inclined to vote for energy with my feet and my money? Yeah, um, I would say the first thing to do is just realize we've had some very large moves in the energy sector. I, I just got done reading. We've had the best month in the energy sector performance wise. In the market ever. Um, so realize that we've had a big run. We're probably going to see some pullbacks over the next couple of you know, weeks and months. Um, but if I, you know, if you ask me to, where would I put my money for the next three to five years, um, I would actually be looking at the oil sands companies, companies like Suncor, companies like Meg Energy, um, Husky Energy, these types of companies. Um, the reason I go after the um, the oil sands companies is they really don't need a lot of capital to function. Um, like I said, you know, with the energy sector, it's a very capital intensive sector. Um, they typically get into trouble because they issue a lot of tax on the drilling programs and then the commodity price collapses and the whole thing becomes unsustainable. With the oil sands companies, they've already, for the most part, incurred the capital cost of the plant. Um, so they end up, you know, having these long production life cycles, 30, 40 years from some of these fields, and they don't have to put too much incremental capital in them. So if oil prices go up, most of that marginal, you know, benefit drops to the investor. For yeah. And, and gas, um, isn't it the same thing with, um, you know, extraction of natural gas? The, the technology is already there. So it's, it's all profit. With, with greater volumes come greater profit without greater expense. Am I right? You're right in the sense that the technology is there um, and they've figured out a way to get it out of the ground fairly easily. Um, the challenge in the United States is that, unlike OPEC, we are not an organized, um, you know, group of producers. So it's every man for himself. And what ends up happening uh, is anytime you have a spike in commodity prices, you know, they will all go put rigs in, rigs in the field and immediately begin producing again. So these spikes you've seen in commodity prices for the past couple of years, they're very short lived. Um, and they end up kind of causing their own failures because they, they can't stay disciplined enough. And every year, you know, they say, we're going to stay disciplined. And every year they don't stay disciplined. So the unfortunate part is, is that as an investor, if you look at some of these names, they haven't, you haven't done very well, um, even though natural gas prices and natural gas production has skyrocketed in this country for the past eight to 10 years. 
You think it'll stay that way? Uh, I think so long as interest rates are as low as they are, there's always going to be investors willing to fund cash burning businesses, which most of it, which most of the shell companies are. <laughs> what, about, what about technology? Uh, I, I'm really interested in, you know, you talk about how technology is mature for certain yeah. kinds of energy, but <clears throat> isn't it so that the world is bristling with technology. It's not just the US and it's not just China, it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's just amazing what's happened to information technology. You can't find a country where there, there aren't cells of young people developing specialty software that is world-class everywhere. It's so interesting what's happening. And so there must be a, sort of a, a connection between that, between the information technology, the biochemistry, uh, yes. all that, and, 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 and energy. So there must be people working on better fuel cells, all that stuff. What, where does that play in your analysis? So it's, the technology component is actually, it, it's come a long, long way in the shale production you know, life cycle. Um, when we started, you know, we as an industry in the shale industry in 2006, they were drilling wells and getting X, we'll just call it X, X amount of reserves per well, you know, per day um, out of these wells. Each well has probably become, you know, 80 to 100% more efficient over that life cycle, purely from technology. You know, now we have, we used to have a, a person who would man the drill above the ground. Um, and now we have, an, you know, a computer that basically does it to optimize the drilling path, to make sure that the cost is as low as possible, to capture the most reserves out of the well. Um, to ensure the life cycle of the well is very long. And from a consumer standpoint, this is excellent, right? You want to have the cheapest cost of energy. You don't want to waste these wells. Um, we figured out ways to, you know, go from 150 acre spacing between wells to now 75 to 45. So they're increasing not just the efficiency per well, but they're increasing the amount of locations in the field they can get the energy out of. And so again, these are all little technological advances that we've had and they add up over time. So it's been great from a consumer standpoint. I mean, you probably remember the days of natural gas being $16, $17 a unit. Um, even post, you know, pre-08, it was $10, $12 per unit. I mean, natural gas will have moments where it flirts with $4 a unit and then goes right back down to two fifty or three. And that's been the case for about four a decade. Will we be able to hold on to the lead in natural gas because of that technology? We're, we're in great shape with natural gas selling everywhere and lots of places we are going to be selling in. Uh, can we stay ahead that way? I think so. I mean, natural gas, um, the shale rock in the United States is very unique. Uh, we don't typically see a lot of other places with you know, the high quality shale that we have in the States. So from a production standpoint, there's a lot of opportunity still in this country to find more and more natural gas than you can't find in other places. We also have the technology. It's been, they've made attempts. Some of the big major companies have made attempts to take it out of places in the world with limited success. They just don't have the ability to, to find these types of you know uh, acreage positions to you know scale up to produce from um, that you would find over here. So we do have the capability to keep it in this country to continue to grow it, um, so long as the capital markets stay open and people are willing to fund this. You know the drilling programs, then you're probably going to keep seeing growth. So am I, should I be looking at uh, short-term, intermediate-term, long-term investments in energy? Um, you know, we have this uh, remarkable transition going on now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, certainly uh, Joe Biden is going to come up with some new policies. Um, do you have an idea what they might be and who his energy czar is? I guess we do know that. Um, and, and how is that going to affect my uh, investment decisions going forward? Yeah, I think a lot, you know, a lot of every election cycle, we, we hear, you know, so-and-so saved the shale industry or so-and-so gave birth to it. I mean, I've heard the last four presidents say that. Um, so it's, it's interesting, right, that when Biden came in, there was a lot of, you know, fear mongering about his desire to take down the shale industry. I, mean, I think I'm sure he's going to say to his base what they want to hear, but ultimately we're not going to take, you know, 8 million barrels a day of oil capacity out of the United States, um, that would just wreck the entire world's economy. So that, that will not happen. Um, I think the Biden administration, as well as the Democratic Congress, is leaning more towards trying to fund um, clean energy. You know, we've heard some things about a Green New Deal and such. Um, we're still kind of waiting on the details for those types of things, right? 
Um, I do think there's going to be an eye on battery storage, an eye on funding more solar, an eye on subsidizing people from you know transitioning out of coal mining jobs and and you know, maybe coal power plants to more you know say less emitting technologies like natural gas. There will be a transition on that. Um, I actually don't expect much to change from a you know targeting shale or not targeting shale standpoint. Um, it's a big sector. A lot of money comes out of that sector into other portions of the economy. Um, high paying jobs and those are very valuable both votes, especially in states like Pennsylvania. I have a dream, Hassan. Mm -hmm. my, my dream is that not too long after January 20th, uh, we, uh, we get back together again here on ThinkTech and uh, we have a further discussion of the way it looks, at least from that vantage, uh, because it'll be very interesting to see how, how things change. It, it won't only be direct changes by that administration on energy, it'll be the whole panoply of things that happen uh, in other areas of policy that have a, a secondary effect on energy. So uh, I hope you'll be available to me uh, January, February, March, where we can uh, circle back and continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you for coming around. Hassan Ahmad, a, uh, an expert, certainly global expert, a brilliant discussion on global energy. Thank you so much.